Welcome to Founders Week YQG. My name is Leanne Barakat, Marketing Coordinator for the University of Windsor Epicenter. This event is all about bringing together entrepreneurs, startups, innovators, change makers, entrepreneurial support organizations, local leaders, and community. Our goal is to celebrate, educate, connect, and build momentum and opportunity around our region's startup community. While this event is virtual, we would like to respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather today is the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Petawami peoples. We are grateful to work, learn, and live in this area. This week would not have been made possible without our generous sponsors. I'd like to thank the Province of Ontario, the St. Clair College Alumni Association, the Job Shop, Libro Credit Union, Workforce Windsor-Essex, Baker Tilly uh, Windsor LLP, Alpha Core Group, Ven Truitt, Epicenter, Small Business and Entrepreneurship Center, Gen Genesis Entrepreneurship Center, and WeTech Alliance. Thank you for putting hashtag founders first. For more information about our sponsors, please check out wetechalliance.com slash foundersweek. Today's session is hosted by the University of Windsor Epicenter. The University of Windsor Epicenter is the entrepreneurial hub on the University of Windsor campus. New to business, have an existing business, looking for mentorship? No matter the stage of your entrepreneurial journey, we can help. We invite students and recent graduates of all disciplines to explore entrepreneurial thinking and culture through our free workshops, monthly events, and so much more. Please visit our website today to learn how you can get involved. Now to the housekeeping items. To be considerate and accommodate everyone attending today, we are doing things a bit differently this meetup by leveraging Zoom webinars. You might not be able to see all the attendees, but you will have ample opportunity to engage with our guests during the Q&A session. Feel free to use the chat feature located at the bottom of the video window to engage with session attendees. Should you experience any technical difficulty, difficulties, please send a message in the chat box. This session will be recorded. A video file, audio file, and relevant links will be available on WeTech Alliance's YouTube channel and included in the atten attendee follow-up email. We're also streaming the session live on the WeTech Alliance Facebook page. And finally, let's make sure everyone knows that Founders Week YQG is where it's at. Be sure to share your hashtag Founders Week YQG experience on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Also, we have created custom shareable gifts for the event to amplify your Instagram stories. In the gift section uh, search bar, please look up WeTech Alliance uh, to find custom gifts for this event. Now I would like to welcome my good friend and our moderator today and the recipient of the powerhouse uh, in person for BizX Awards, Adam Castle to the stage. Adam Castle has spent the last 10 years working in economic development in Windsor, Essex, specializing in business development and growth across multiple sectors and working with companies of all sizes. Adam started his career, however, in social work and coaches his clients in the space where mental health and business strategy inter intersect. On behalf of the Founders Week YQG team, thank you for joining us today. And thank you so much for the introduction. It's so great to be here. So I've got the pleasure today of introducing our panelists. We're gonna be going through this conversation. So let's find out who's joining us to help explore the different ways we can all start tackling our stress a little bit better. First up, we have Erica Puzwali, social worker, CEO, and founder of Pure Mentality, which offers up an e-commerce store curated by mental health professionals and offers in-person counseling with professionals focused and specialized in all life stages. Erica, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, and next up, we have Jackie Valerian, Academy Director at Valerian Music Academy, featuring music lessons taught by experienced professionals who don't just teach music, they live it. Jackie, welcome. And last but not least, Mara Bellano, social entrepreneur and marketing expert. Mara has founded several businesses and leverages social selling to each and every one of her growing customers in this incredible growing customer base. So Mara, thank you so much for being here as well. Thanks for having me, Adam. Yeah, so this afternoon, we're going to be concentrating in on strategies to help cope with stress. And judging by our attendees, we had a number of registrants. This is a topic we all want to learn a whole lot more about. We all feel stress. And I know for a fact that all of our panel panelists, myself included, basically sprinted just to get to this session right now. So we're all already stressed. So we have to consider a couple of things. 
So we all feel stressed. We're all learning about coping strategies and learning about coping strategies is a journey. We tend to have a lot of patience and we give a lot of patience to others when they're learning, but we rarely give ourselves that same grace or patience when we're trying to learn something. So for today's session, rule number one for all of our attendees and our panelists, first thing we got to do is just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. We're here. We're in this moment. We're all going to learn together and it's going to be great. And rule number two is we all have to practice a little bit of self-patience. We're all learning. We're all getting better at this. And we're going to learn here today together, which is amazing. So what is stress? I thought it might be really helpful to look at what it actually is. The human body is such an incredible machine and to really set things up, scientists have actually figured out that our bodies evolved to experience stress, right? It's not a mistake that we feel it. It means there's a very real evolutionary purpose for all of us to feel the way we do when we're stressed out. So back when most of our activities were survival based, stress was a tool that we really relied on to spot threats and kick our bodies into overdrive to escape them. A lot has changed since then, obviously. And so what we have now is this incredibly sophisticated system, our bodies, reacting to all kinds of things that our modern brains have been trained to tune into. So it's kind of an issue. Sometimes, though, stress is our body's way of telling us that we're about to be a total badass and do something that requires courage, like public speaking or having a difficult conversation. But what you can do or what do we do when the same feeling gets to be too much? What happens when it starts to get overwhelming? And how can we teach ourselves to learn to recognize when our stress reactions are hindering us more than helping? Well, that's where today's panel might prove helpful. To kick us off, let's look at the, some of the ways that stress really just shows up in our lives. The first question for all of our panelists today, starting with Erica, is how do you know when your stress levels are creeping up and what shape does it take in your life? Uh, well, I would hope that I'm pretty good at this. So I'll just tell <laughs> you kind of when my notch, I have a high stress level, but I know because I get, I often, uh, my immune system just shuts itself down. So I don't get sick unless I'm stressed out. Yeah. I'm pretty strong. I have a great immune system. But once I start to feel that sore throat, that congestion, I know that it's my body's response to what's happening. And I also cry a lot. So I just cry over everything, like all the shows, all the all the commercials. Just I know that it's just everything is just too much and I can't handle it. So my body's pretty good at responding and then uh i guess the only other thing is um my eating habits change quite a bit like mm -hmm. i won't eat for i'll realize it's been like two days and i had like a like a granola bar and then i'm like okay something has to change so uh i'm pretty good at recognizing but physically definitely a lot of people don't like match those up they say oh well you know i'm emotional it's for women it's pms it's this it's that like they don't connect the two together and we just need to be a little bit more in tune and think about how many things could be our response to to that stress for sure oh for sure it shows up in so many different ways and actually so for everyone here that doesn't know eric and i used to work together like a million years ago um and when we worked together we that would happen to us quite often is we'd work so hard that we'd both end up getting sick like our whole team would uh and we just assumed that that was the way it was but it doesn't have to be there there's things to change so moving into jackie and, and the team at valerian what does stress look like for for you how does that sort of show up in your lives um, I guess I'll speak first and uh, just just to um, introduce Joe. Joe is the uh, co-owner as well of Varelin Music Academy. Um, so oh, yeah. yeah, we'll just each take a turn, I guess. Um, so yeah, stress, I think I relate to what uh, you said as well, um, because we find that then it affects like if our personal life, as in like how tidy our room is or like how, how long it's been since we bathed our dog, those kind of things, if it's starting to become behind. And that's usually a sign to me like, oh, have we checked in lately with our stress? And um, I think something that helps is just when, whenever we have to do something that's kind of go mode, just trying to take like those deep breaths and, and take it as it comes. But uh, yeah, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, and just to add on to that, I experienced it the same way where my normal daily habits and routine start to, to break down. That's how mm -hmm. I know that, like, you know, things are getting stressful. You know, when my to-do list starts to pile up and, and then I start to neglect the to-do list and that's how I know I got to take a step back, you know, and re, uh, you know, reframe everything a little bit. 
yeah, for sure. Those are super common as well. You know, what, what's getting done, what's not getting done and how, and sometimes too, when we get so stressed out, we're just like, I have so much to do. And so I'm going to do nothing instead. Like that's also an option, right? We hit that sort of like peak level of overwhelm and then nothing ends up happening. So never helpful. So Mara, how does stress show up when it goes unmanaged in your life? Um, I think stress for me uh, materializes as anxiety. Um, a lot of times my stress is actually financially re- um, triggered, uh, especially this last two years, right? My business is mm-hmm. suffering because of the pandemic. Um, I think there are three main ways that I deal with the stress. I'd like to start it off with the first thing I do in the morning. Um, I fix my bed. That is like the most important thing for me throughout the day is as long as I get my bed fixed, then I can do anything else. Um, The second is practicing mindfulness. So the way I talk to myself, what I think about being grateful for certain things, that's a good stress coping mechanism for me as well, because it kind of dials me back to what is my purpose or what do I need to do to, to handle this? So being mindful about what I'm thinking about really helps me. And the third is actually digital digital detox. Um, I try to avoid my phone when I don't need to use it. I know in the panel we talked about on Tuesday, we talked about how long we spend on social media. And because of what I'm trying to accomplish, I spend maybe two, three hours, but that's it. After that, I'm like, okay, no more phones, no more, no more, no more TV if I can. Um, book time, something that's not digital related. Mm. I butchered that word. I don't know why. <laughs> no, that's okay. That works. And, and you know, those are all great sort of uh, tips and tricks on, on how to go through your own stress and start to sort of deal with it. Now, Mara, you sort of had a, an interesting situation because at the beginning of the pandemic, you saw your industries or industries that your startups were in almost completely grind to a halt. So it's got to be obviously very stressful. What were some of the ways that you saw some of your peers sort of dealing with that as well? Because I know it, it sort of goes across industries, right? Everyone was sort of feeling the same thing at the same time. What did you see a lot of in that time period? Well, so some of my peers, they qualified for government assistance. I think, again, for me, finance, finance, finances, really caused a lot of my stress. Um, Mm -hmm. What I found is some of my friends, they were able to qualify for the, for example, $40,000 grant. Because if if they can't pay for their brick and mortar, that's a big uh, uh, source of stress, right? Um, And for me and many other individual um, entrepreneurs, I think that the CERB actually helped a lot to, kind of offset the stress in some ways because then we're not worried about oh how am i going to pay rent or how am i pay, paying the bills mm-hmm. I think that the government assistance last year uh, quite honestly helped me and a lot of people i know that's amazing that's great that, that sort of those supports were in in place we saw that too at we so many of our clients were able to take advantage of it um and you know there was some that slipped through the cracks as well and and trying to find ways to help them cope with quick cope with that stress was a big uh, a big part of what we did over the last year so we've, we're getting all these great perspectives on sort of what stress is what kind of forms it can take and and the consensus at least this far is that all of the things that we're feeling is normal and so everything that you're feeling as an attendee as well in that that stressful realm it's all normal too so Jackie and Joe, we've got a great sort of example of, of a team here and teams deal with stress very differently. So you, you talked a little bit about how you know when the stress is sort of creeping up. We see a lot of solo entrepreneurs at both Epicenter and WeTech. How do you manage that entrepreneurial stress dramatically when you're part of a team? How do you work to keep each other grounded at Valerian? And, and really what different roles do you play within your business to keep the stress in check? Uh, That's a great question. I think I'll um, start by saying I think it's helpful in some ways that there are two of us because one of us is bound to notice that the other is uh, strung thin and we can support each other in that way. Like if Mm -hmm. I feel like Joey's having a rougher week, I might want to help him more at home with some things that he needs help with and vice versa. He usually lets me know when I'm getting into this mode where I'm just totally overwhelmed by like wanting everything to be um, maybe a little too perfect and I need to, you know, take some time for rest. So um, yeah, do you want to comment? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so with us, what we found work, uh, what worked the best uh, was just to have some systems in place that could help us to uh, keep all of our thoughts in check. And uh, that all that was was just a um, a five step priority sort of uh, list where mm -hmm. we say, okay, realistically, we can't do everything. We have a hundred things that we have to do, and we're stressed <laughs> out about everything. Why don't we just go get a coffee and we'll think, okay, realistically, what is the most important thing we have to get done today? And we just narrow it down and that's all we focus on that day. And then that, and then that just really takes the weight off our shoulders. And then, then we do the same thing the next day. And, and that really does a lot to help alleviate the stress and, and working with each other. That's awesome. And, and you can see, you know, for Mara, sort of your process is a number of different initiatives, right? You start with these steps and you know that if you accomplish the, the things on your list, that the rest of it becomes easier, right? If I can make my bed, then every other sort of step in my day becomes a little bit easier because I'm already doing things. And for Jackie and Joe, you can sort of see how, you know, you've created this great accountability together, right? You, you keep each other accountable to not only your stress levels, but also like, are we doing the things that we said we'd do? Are we sort of moving through uh, life at the same sort of page that we sort of agreed to? And then you've also created this great ability to focus in on things, right? What's really important to us right now? What do we have to get done? And what's just sort of adding stress on top? I think those three strategies are incredible because there's something that we can all leverage a little bit of, right? And even if you're not in an entrepreneurial team, as, as many of our attendees may not be, you can still use accountability with friends and family and even our entrepreneurial community as well, or your business advisor to play that role of saying like, okay, we said we're going to do some stuff. How are we, how are we doing? Can we check in? Are we able to sort of get a, a temperature check on how we're feeling um, and make sure that we're not taking on more than we, we promised we would, right? And so Erica, you're a social worker. You actually saw professional stress as such a prevalent challenge that you started a business to help address it. So how can entrepreneurs set themselves up for success when it comes to addressing the stress that goes hand in hand with, with just owning a business? Uh, so the biggest thing is, is organization and people tell me, oh, like, I'm just not an organized person. Uh, it looks different for everybody. So find what works for you or ask somebody to help you find what works for you mm -hmm. because, you know, it doesn't always mean, um, agendas and, and stationary and all, I mean, it does for me, but for other people, it doesn't always mean that. And I think there's this like worldview of what it looks like and so people get discouraged and they say well I can't do all of that I can't bullet journal I can't do all these things and that's fine but you need to find what it is for you what it means and you need to develop consistent routine as much as possible entrepreneurs mm. things happen things pop up obviously but if you can you know get up and make your bed every morning or do something for yourself every night or whatever it is it needs to be very consistent and routine uh, because stress does turn into all kinds of other concerns. And so if we're not organized in our own way, it's not going to work. Uh, also setting time for you, literally like booking time off. So it's not, I'm going to do something for me this week. It's, mm -hmm. you know, looking at that calendar on Monday and saying, okay, Thursday, I have this chunk, I'm going to take two hours of it and do what I want to do for me and not letting other things trump it or push it away. Like we're not putting in clients or taking time, like you have to book time. I'd love to have the, you know, more clients means more money. I get that. But we come to the point where we get sick and then we have no clients and no money because we didn't take an hour a week to do what we needed to do. So I quite literally book in like laundry time because it just, then you realize it piled up and you have 56 loads to do when mm -hmm. if you just, I book it in and it takes me half an hour and I'm done. That's it for the whole week. Right. So, um, literally book self care or self time in, make it like a color, give it a color, whatever you got to do. Um, make it a, a visual thing. And then the last one's just talk to people like, um, therapy has, has become such a like taboo subject still. And it, we have such a, like a crisis base to us. And my mm -hmm. mission is to make therapy maintenance, right? Like we go to yearly physicals yeah. and we go to all this stuff to take care of our physical body, but people don't come to me until 
it's like the very last thing they do. So just coming to say, hey, are my feelings valid? Am I in a good place? What can I be doing better? How can I build a self-care plan? What does it look like? Like you don't need to be in a crisis to come and speak with somebody. And I think that that's super important to know. And maybe that is another mentor, business mentor, a friend or whoever it is, or a professional, it doesn't matter, but um, don't leave it until it's like unmanageable. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't, I think we can't sort of overestimate or, or over talk about how important having that professional help is. Um, there was sort of a great, uh, one, of, one of my really great profs in, in university always said like every good counselor has one, um, which is to say like, like even people that are dealing with this stuff on a daily basis or helping other people through, they need support as well. Like everyone needs support. And, and Erica, as you're saying, it, it shouldn't have to be something that you go to. We don't go to the doctors only when we're, we need to go to the hospital, right? Like it, it isn't only when we're going to the emergency room, it should be all the time. And these little check-ins that you can sort of set up. Also, I, I think people get scared away with the amount of like work that goes into therapy, right? I, I don't want to go through the process of like figuring out all my feelings and diving too, too deep. But if you're doing the work in a maintenance way, just like with your laundry, Erica, if you set time a half hour every week to do it, in half an hour, it's done. But if you're only going to your therapist, you're only talking to a counselor when things are really bad, it's a lot for them to work with through you. So having that regular schedule and again, sort of setting that, that pace of like, this is something that I'm going to do on a, on a regular basis really helps with the fact that it doesn't have to be that much work. It could be super accessible, could be really easy for you to get into. Um, and the other thing too, and Erica, maybe you can talk to this. What are some of those common myths that people hold about counseling and about therapy that really aren't true? Um, well, like it, well, first to say like some myths, unfortunately, you know, you get old school counselors and they are kind of true still. So you really have to look at who is the best match for you. And sometimes that means work and that's, you know, you got to put the work in to find somebody that fits like what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but you just, I do things a little bit differently. It's about, you know, it's not just, you just come and talk to somebody like for an hour, right? People come and they're like, I don't know what to say for an hour. Okay, well, <laughs> that's not really how it happens. Um, yeah. You know, I have prompts and I have activities and I have backup plans and I have things for you. And if you find a counselor that is a good fit for you, they will lead the session. And one hour is like five seconds. They're all like, you know, oh, it's over. So um, don't be afraid. Like, don't think you need 60 minutes of conversation to go to therapy because that's not what happens. You can talk for 60 minutes, but... Uh, we also lead the conversation and, and get to lots of other things, right? We connect things. So if you're, for example, the good, the thing about stress, right? So, oh, I'm feeling great. I'm not stressed at all, but I, you know, I haven't gone to work in a week. My body doesn't feel good. Like we connect those things for you. So if you think there's nothing, we'll find like what those triggers are, what those things are, what's happening and break it down for you. So don't be afraid. Don't think you need 60 minutes of of work to do. Another thing is, um, don't be afraid to change your counselor. It's not offensive. Mm. A lot of people will stick with and pay and continue to go see a counselor that they don't believe is doing anything. It's not offensive. Everybody counsels in a different way. Um, you know, I hear this all the time. People are like, I was there for so long. I don't want to do this again. It's, it's not the same. It's different for everybody. People are going to need different things. People counsel in different ways. So please do not feel like we will be offended if you switch counselors. I 1000% promote it to people. Sometimes people come in and I say, listen, that's not my specialty. You're welcome to stay. I will learn it and I will do what I can. But please, you know, this is a list of people that are specialized in this area. So if you get a good social worker, they'll make you feel like you can switch. But just know in your mind that it, you can totally switch just like you switch hairdressers or like you don't feel bad about that so it's the same thing well um, it depends on the person I actually like yeah, no yeah. matter what haircut I get I'm like oh it looks great it's awesome right. and then you go home bald right so it's not not helpful makes sense and some yeah. clients will like all the social workers so you know yeah. who knows so those are like the biggest things and also um there are social workers out there that don't make it institutionalized 
So, you know, find the comfy spaces, find the places that make you feel at home. Uh, you just got to do a little bit of work. Unfortunately. Yeah, and there's lots of opportunity too. Like there's, there's a ton of options out there, as, especially in Windsor, Essex. Um, we have, you know, amazing social workers that have a lot of their own private practices. Um, I think there, there's not a whole lot of advertising around it. So do some work a little bit deeper than a Google search too, um, which is like, you know, talk to CMHA, chat with, with uh, other counselors, send a message out to social workers like Erica, who are, who are sort of, uh, you know, plugged into this space and know uh, where and who everyone is. Um, do the research ahead of time too, so that that can really help. Now, some of the industries that we sort of looked at over the pandemic or, or throughout the pandemic really took on a, a huge sort of like brunt of, of the hit, right? And Mara and Jackie and Joe, you're both in those industries that were closed for, for you know, uh, some part of time, um, whether it's Mara, which has been sort of like total or Jackie and Joe, which was in part as well for in person. Um, what was that like sort of as an industry? And if you're someone else is in your industry, what would you want to tell them about taking the first steps to combating some of the stress and to really getting back on your feet and back into what's sort of next for the world and, and the economy there? And, and Mara, we'll start with you. Okay, um, I think that for me, what I did was when it all happened, I decided that, okay, I'll take a quick break. So I took maybe a week of just not doing anything except for take care of myself and do, do the things I love doing that I couldn't really do um, because of my businesses. So mm -hmm. I think I mean, if this does happen again, or if anyone was going through the same thing, if you can't afford it, try to take time off and try to just um, recalibrate, recalibrate where you're headed. Because if you just keep going, I think that you might make rash decisions because you, you probably will be in the desperate spot. So I think that taking that time off will be actually useful. Fantastic. And, and Joe and, and Jackie, how do you, how do you sort of look at it as well? Because there's lots of, you know, businesses, not necessarily music schools, but definitely your type that have had that experience of like, we're in a shutdown. There's not a lot you can do, right? So what does that sort of look like now on the other side of things? How are you taking those first steps to get back into the world? Um, if you want to go first this time. Oh, okay. Um, well, we actually started up during the pandemic. Um, so it was just a matter, like, I guess I would tell anybody who like maybe wants to start something in our industry or isn't it like, that's the beauty of like doing something you love for a living. I think because mm -hmm. like, if you have that passion, like you can think of creative ways to get around some of those obstacles. So for us, we were like, okay, well, there's a lot of online students and now we don't just have to teach people from here. We can teach people from all over Canada. So we had students for a while and we still have some of them that just like it now, but, um, you know, from Ottawa or Toronto or wherever. Um, and it certainly was still tough. Like I, I think um, some of the in-person, we have to be obviously very cautious, very safe, make people feel comfortable to come in. Um, but yeah, that was, I think that's kind of how we adjusted. We've had like a half and half sort of um, online and in-person method. Mm -hmm. And um, when we first got our location uh, back in June, I think that what really kept our head on straight, straight and um, managed all of those, uh, you know, stressful nerves was just having a plan. And I think that having, you know, a backup plan and so solutions to some of these problems can bring a lot of peace of mind. So right. having, you know, a, you know, resort A or resort B sort of thing, you know, can really just take a lot of the stress off. Yeah, absolutely. And so as a music school, you probably deal a lot with folks that come to you that are super stressed. So tell us a little bit about that process. How are you helping people through it as well with your business? Um, well, I think, I think music and like um, therapy, I don't want to like, you know, be offensive for people who are more in therapy, but um, I'm, I'm finishing up an undergrad in psych and um, I feel like music and psych go together so much. And there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who come in and they just want their kid to actually have like, it's not even about the music lesson as much. It's like, I want them out of the house because they're struggling because of this. And, you know, with school being online before, a lot of the parents that came to us, they just wanted their kid to have like 
almost like a therapeutic music session and just just get out. So um, that's been kind of fun, actually allowing people to come in and, and relieve their stress that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's awesome. You know, I, I think that's sort of another myth, right? It's like people assume that there's only one way to tackle stress or there's one and it is therapy or it is counseling. Um, but really, and, and I know Erica will attest to this too, a lot of the, the, the best social workers and the best counselors will look at a holistic approach, right? You do talk, talk therapy as they call it or counseling, but then there's also yoga and there's also all of these other things that you can do that, that sort of connect you to different sort of parts of, of yourself that, that alleviate stress, right? That takes sort of time for you. Now, I know that, um, Marla, you have this incredible sort of collection of businesses under you and they all focus in on self-care. So people are also coming to you to help bust stress, right? They want to be taken care of. They want to sort of get through uh, the worst of their days by, by doing a little something and investing back in them. How do you sort of incorporate that into your practices as, as a small business owner as well? Um, I, so last year when that all started, obviously that was the peak of the most, I guess, stressful I've ever been in my whole life. Um, I tried to bring people together. So, I did some events called Self Love Saturdays and it was all online. And it was just a way for people to get together, um, get more in touch with themselves and kind of build a little community, a, a nano community, if, if you will. Um, I think that was one of the ways I, I tried to help my community is to mm-hmm. uh, do like online events, just like we're doing now. Um, but yeah, I think, Last year, that was what worked for me. It was like looking for community. And what's interesting, because you're a solo entrepreneur, but you found that like the connection and the accountability and everything that Jackie and Joe sort of use to help power their business is something that you sort of seek out as well. And I think that's such a great idea is if you don't have anyone immediately around you, there's always a wider community that you can tap into. And the internet, as you were saying, is such a great tool to be able to connect because it doesn't matter how close you are, you can be anywhere and still sort of have that, uh, that opportunity. So Erica, why don't you take us through a bit of an exercise or a bit of a, a bit of a little bit of work here on what we can do as entrepreneurs to sort of start our days off. What's sort of a, a bit of a reflection or a mantra that we can use to sort of help us through? Uh, you didn't tell me that was one of the questions. So, Surprise. Um, so I'm a little stressed. No stress. But... No stress. <laughs> <laughs> um, making sure. Okay. So it is super important to, like I said, have a, a routine. Uh, part of that is sleep. So I know we don't yeah. have time to sleep. That's a thing. Make time to sleep because uh, it's incredibly important. So in more so than sleep is sleeping at the same time every single day. Your life will like change drastically if you can have a routine of, a, even if it's four hours of sleep, if it's the same hours, it is going to change your life. So try and be consistent with your sleep schedule of um, not only how much, but like what time you're going to bed, because uh, your body's going to come on a cycle and it's just going to, it's going to thank you very, very much. So it won't matter if you get up at four o'clock in the morning, uh, as long as you're doing it every single day. So it will help you in the long run. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then planning the night before, save your life. Okay. Yeah. So uh, always be prepared or as prepared as we can be things happen, things are gonna, you know, but take a look, what do I have to do tomorrow? What do I have to, you know, what do I have to prepare? Do I have the clothing? Is my laundry done? Like all of those things, because then we wake up and it's like, okay, I have half an hour to find, you know, pick the dirty clothes out of the basket and do this and feed, make sure that I make dinner ahead of time because, you know, I'm in appointments all day, so I'm not going to make dinner. And it's just a lot in the morning, like mornings needs to be a little bit, you need to give yourself a little bit of time to wake up. So do it at night before you go to bed. And then when you get up making the bed, huge thing, uh, because it it is something that you accomplished in the day. So it will help in the long run. And uh, also on top of that is waking up earlier. I know a nightmare for a lot of people, 
but the mornings is when your brain is the most productive. And some people say, oh, I'm a night person, but well, biologically, your brain is the most productive in the morning. So even if it's half an hour, give yourself an extra half an hour to literally you do you like have that (laughs) tea by yourself, sit in the quiet, stare at, you know, play with the cat or the dog, go for a walk, do something that's not work. Uh, And that includes like housework, like all, it's all work. So (laughs) literally just sit with your thoughts, you know, go outside, whatever makes you the happiest, take that extra time. Because as much as people will say to me, well, I'd rather sleep, right? But your body and your mind would, would prefer the other way. I promise it sounds like a nightmare, but I promise that's what it is. So give yourself the extra half an hour to an hour. Um, I wake up very early in the morning and people think I'm nuts, but I like, by the time I get to someone's normal day at seven, like my, my housework is done. My, you know, my administrative work is done. Everything's done by seven o'clock. And so, um, it's just, it's a power time. It's a time for you to, for things to be silent in your home. You know, if people are sleeping or whatever. It's just a time for you to, to kind of do your own thing. So I would suggest just preparing the night before having time for yourself in the morning, uh, being prepared for the day as much as possible. And, uh, remember to be patient with yourself in that, uh, it may not turn out the way that you planned it to be. So just kind of take that and be like, okay, (laughs) this is my day, but it may not go this way. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think so. I can already hear questions like, well, I don't have any time. You're telling me to take more time. I don't have any. And I think what you mentioned earlier about scheduling things into your calendar is so important. So if you've got a to do list that is 40 pages long and you're never putting those items actually on your calendar, they will never get done, especially the ones that are like, these are big and important, but I've got two months to do them. I'll just do them at some other point. I'll do them a little bit later. And then a little bit later comes and it's like tomorrow and you're freaking out about it. So anything that's big and is important and that comes with like doing the laundry or all of those little items, making the time to put them into your calendar is how you're actually going to find time. And then the other piece too, is what Erica said about waking up earlier as well. We actually psychologically don't feel like the later we're up is our time. It doesn't feel restful because we've already gone through an entire day of dealing with the entire world. It's exhausting. So when you set your alarm a little bit earlier and you get up, it does feel fresh. There isn't sort of a ton of jumbled ideas or, or, you know, stressful thoughts that have already been pounding in your head for the last 12 hours. You start fresh and and it's sort of this opportunity to get up and and to find some, some sort of extra time. So I want to sort of switch a little bit tack here because I think we need some advice to customers, right? One of the things that we've heard a lot about during the pandemic is the way customers treat those who are serving us in those frontline positions. And and we're not just talking about in grocery stores or in hospitals, but in customer facing roles sort of across the, across the spectrum. And a lot of the time for small businesses and, and as true here, the customer service is handled by the owner because you're amazing and have a million different hats on it all the time. But what are some of the ways that you think your mental health feels supported by your customers or how can we all start doing a little bit extra or a little bit more or a little bit different? What can we do different when we're out interacting in the community that can make our entrepreneurs in Windsor and Essex feel more supported? Like they're, they're, they're being taken care of by customers. Cause I think that that's a really important distinction we have to make in that everyone always assumes that customers always right. And everything should be towards customer service, but like, the workers need grace too. They need to, they need to get a little bit of slack as well. And so what are some ways that you sort of feel supported in that? And we'll, we'll start with the team over at Valerian. Um, yeah. Uh, so, well, I think one thing for us, like, um, like wanting to buy from other small businesses once in a while when we can, obviously budget wise, mm-hmm. but like uh, just giving them that sort of support because Um, I just feel like it's just also just good karma, but also just the idea that it brings a little bit of relief to someone. Um, And then, I mean, uh, this is sort of related, but I mean, we have a few families who, you know, are like that in our lives right now that come to our school. There's a specific mother who comes in every week with ideas, even if we haven't asked. And she Mm -hmm. literally made last week this like 
itinerary for us for like this camp idea. And it's just amazing because it's like, she doesn't have to do that. She does not have to, you know, uh, care about what we're doing that much. And uh, it's just like a kindness circle, you know, cause we're with her daughter, we're spoiling her daughter and she's, she's helping us out. And it makes us feel like, yeah, we want to make the customer feel, um, really, you know, taken care of, but it's also a nice balance of, you know, getting a little bit of that care from a customer. It's really cool. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. And the difference between a, uh, you know, a positive customer and a negative customer is pretty big on, you know, business owners. And I know that when we have a positive interaction, it just really makes us feel like, wow, we're doing, we're doing good. We're doing the right thing. This is awesome. And it can really affect, you know, uh, so that's always, and just, uh, to add on to Jackie's point with that parent the other day who gave us all the ideas, <laughs> there's a full printed out list, cool. nicely detailed. It was awesome. <laughs> that's wicked. So I think, cool. I think she has the right mentality when going into a business, a small business in our community, which is like, remember that you're kind of a part of this team, right? Like if our small businesses aren't doing well, none of us are doing well in this community. So as you go through and you go into these small businesses, remember that you're like, you're a big part of the reason why they exist. Right. Um, and, and treating people with, with, I think patience is really important. You know, we discussed at the top of this, how we don't give ourselves patience. Um, but I think sometimes, uh, especially lately, everyone's patience has been worn thin, right? Like we're all feeling as crappy as, as everybody else because we've all been in this collective trauma for, for two long years. So remembering that, you know, the folks that you're working with are always going through something too, right? So uh, Mara, how do you sort of feel about this and, and what can people do to make you feel as supported and, and make your mental health feel supported as well as customers? Um, I mean, uh, aside from the obvious, like supporting my business and trying to um, interact and engage with me on social media, I think if if a customer can't afford my services or my products, at the very least, it's going to be really um, something I'm grateful for if they interact with me on social media, because that in itself helps my business a lot. Um, but I think what goes around comes back around. If I want customers to support me, I support other businesses as well, just mm -hmm. like uh, Jackie was saying, um, by being a good customer myself. So I do that for other businesses as well. So for their social media, I interact with them, engage with them as much as I can. So I think then that comes back around and actually helps me as well. For sure. And Erica, I'm going to actually switch up the question a little bit, because obviously there's lots of ways that we can make our mental health professionals feel like they're valued. But as a potential patient uh, or as a potential someone who wants to go and get uh, a new mental health professional in their lives, what are some of the steps that people can take to like start and set themselves up for success? Because if you're not going into these types of situations with the right mentality, it's really hard to get a lot out of it. So what are those sort of like pre sort of boarding <laughs> things that you can do before you start taking a journey into your own mental health? Uh, I think the most important is to not have like specific expectations. Um, you can kind of say, oh, I want to work on or I want to do this or that. But to go in there with an open mind and realize what could happen and what could change for you will make all the difference in the like in the whole wide world. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is not worrying about what other people like, you know, parents come to me and they're just so upset because they have to send their child to therapy. And I always commend those parents and say, you know what, like you are the greatest humans on the planet for busting that down and saying, you know, what? I don't care what other people say, or maybe they do, but they bring their yeah. kids anyways. And so I think there's such a fear that you know, they're so scared that it's going to be like, look bad on them. Or some people have even said to me, like, can they see that I've gotten there? Like, can my boss see that I've come here? And I was like, I hope so. Because, you know, like, it doesn't matter. So I think just knowing that it is so wonderful for your soul, that um, to not have expectations, to not feel bad about it, to not um, think that you're a bad parent or friend or you know, family member, or if you've used EAP services, 
encourage other individuals at work to do the same. Yeah. It is just like, you know, we all get those massages because they're covered, right? But like nobody uses the therapy services. And what happens is we're going to lose that. Companies are not going to buy into a therapy package if nobody's using it. So yeah. people are like, oh, well, my company doesn't provide that. Well, has anyone ever gone to use it? Like they're terrified. Yeah. So then it gets taken away. And the problem is there's no funding, you know, for we are in a, a mental health crisis. And a lot of people didn't realize the, you know, what would happen with the pandemic as far as like mental health with all ages. Mm. It's happening, you know, I have tinies coming in and I'm just like how these kids know the damage of the pandemic and they're six years old is blows my mind. So just understanding that those, if you do have services and you're lucky enough, great. If not, invest in them. And again, when you get to a crisis, the problem is I need to see you once or twice a week. But if you go maintenance, everybody buys enough coffee to afford one session a month. Like, don't tell me that you don't. So it is very feasible. Um, if you just budget it into, you know, we make all this, we put all these ridiculous things on our budget, you know, hair and nails and all kinds of things that are great for us. They're good for our soul, but so is, you know, music and other therapies that we need to be doing. So just thinking about budgeting and making it part of your life and so normal, whatever way you seek therapy. So it doesn't need to be counseling, but whatever those yeah. things are for you, self-care things um, needs to be a regular part of like our everyday life. Oh, for sure. I think there's like two shifts there that have to happen internally before you're like, you're ready to go. Right. And the first is looking at it from a lens of not, I have to go do something to, I get to go do something. Right. Like it's such a privilege to be able to have these types of resources in our community, um, whether or not you're paying for them or taking advantage of free ones. Um, but, but it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity, right? It's not something that's given. It should be. Uh, but there's a lot of places that don't have that. So, so thinking of it from that perspective of like, I get to go do this and, and maybe fueling some of that, that motivation and momentum behind it. And then the next is, as you were talking about, is, is that idea of, you know, the preparations to invest in yourself, caring about yourself to care all the way. Don't just care about your body, care about your mind too, because if you don't have that, you're, you're not really getting anywhere. Um, and, and those are really helpful. So we're into questions now. We're going to move into the Q&A portion of the event. So if anyone has questions, please send them on it through. We do have one here from Nuseba, which is, do eating certain foods make you feel more stressed? Which is, uh, which is awesome. Anyone want to take this question in specific? Yeah, Mara, go ahead. I found this to be true because I became kind of a health nut last year during the pandemic. I started exercising a lot. And in combination with bad food, my, I felt bad. It actually made me more depressed when I'm eating junk food, for example. Mm -hmm. And then there were bouts where I was only eating salads, nuts, you know, healthy foods like that. And it made me feel a lot better and a lot more productive because my body is telling me that, oh, I like what you're doing. I like what you're feeding me. So then that actually made me more productive. But yeah, I noticed a big difference when I um, switched my diet last year. Yeah, and to say, but I would tack on to that as well as someone who's sort of gone through uh, a bit of a, a health journey, mental and physical in the last little bit. Um, what we've actually found in, in studies is that the types of foods we eat is directly related to how much stress and anxiety we feel um, and depression and all of the other sort of things. Your, your body is regulated by hormones and what we eat fuels what hormones are released. And actually, there's a really cool sort of stat out there that if you're eating stuff that's highly processed, so it hits your bloodstream and immediately you get this like jolt of energy, what you're doing is you're setting yourselves up for, for an anxiety attack at some point in the near future, because what your body does is you get this huge sort of shot of, of blood sugar or glucose, and as you fall, 
your body starts to wonder why, what's going on. It doesn't really know how to process it. And so when we're eating foods that aren't natural for us, your body reacts in a way that it doesn't know how to process them. So it gets really confused. And the byproduct of that sometimes, a lot of the time can be anxiety. It can be stress. Um, and even taking, you know, taking note of like, are we in taking more caffeine than we should? Are we taking in, you know, foods that give us energy at times when we need to start letting go of that energy um, and taking a look at, at sort of that process? us as well. We've got another great uh, question here from Sue, a uh, little bit lengthy, so uh, I'm going to run through it. So the pandemic has created huge stressors for employers who also end up having to be a frontline mental health support system. So Eric, I think this one's for you. Whether or not they're equipped to do so, it really creates havoc, both for the employer and the employees. So what are some of the types of programs that you'd recommend to help prepare employers to not only support the well-being of the team, but for their own self-care as well? So we actually did just this during the pandemic with uh, Booster Juice, with a couple of owners from Booster Juice. We started a, a Boost Your Self Care campaign. And it was actually like, they came to me with a semi idea and we kind of built it together. So the whole idea was uh, I presented what self care can look like for employees. So I went into the business, I saw their employees, we talked about what it looks like and the fact that it looks different for every person because I think we get this this very fatty vert, like fat as in fat. I don't know if that's a word, but like a fat <laughs> looking enough. version yeah. of what self-care is supposed to look like, you know, when it's, it's bath bombs and, and that, like yeah. it's this gratitude journal, like, okay, that's great. And I'm sure that works for some people, but it doesn't work for everybody. Right. So, um, we started this, this social media campaign, I guess, and they had a group and every time one of their employees would post about something they did for themselves that they recognized as self-care, whatever that was for them, uh, they got a ballot and the employer purchased self-care boxes um, that had different products in it that, you know, could be used for self-care. So really um, encouraging one another, like accountability is huge. So they were basically, they turned it into a contest, but it was like they were benefiting. So nobody was losing, nobody, it wasn't like a, a sales contest who sells the most, who like, that's just a lot of stress. So mm -hmm. really making a contest about them. Uh, the employer was, you know, they could also win. So that was super cool. And they just, they kind of one upped each other on their self care. And it was fantastic to see that they would compete on who could, you know, do the most self care. So that's, that's a very simple way, especially if you can't provide benefits because they are expensive. It's a very simple way to say, hey, we do care about your self-care and what you're doing. Um, checking in, super, super easy to do. Bring in those employees, talk to them, get to know them, let them know that, you know, you want to know about their, their personal life if they want to share that with you. Um, they're not just people. They're not just numbers that bring in numbers like, those kinds of simple things, but it just encouraging self-care in the workplace. What does that look like? Do you have a station? Do you have free water bottles? If someone forgets, do you have, you know, granola bars? If people didn't have time to bring a lunch, like all of these very simple things. Um, I always have snacks for my kids that come in because sometimes they're feeling so anxious after school that they haven't eaten all day because they have to go to therapy and they have to cry and they hate it. And so they'll come starving because they literally have, and once they're here, they love it, right? Like we have a great time, but they know they have to talk and it's very anxiety ridden for them. Mm -hmm. So they don't eat all day. So I always have snacks for them and I have snacks for my staff and I, you know, simple, simple things that show that your environment embraces self-care and mental health. It can be very, very simple and very, very cost-effective. That's awesome. We're almost out of time. So we got to sort of wrap to the, the outro, but I know that there are a couple more questions in the chat there. Um, our, uh, our amazing panelists are available. So if you want to send them a message and get their ideas on things, feel free to do that. Um, they're happy to sort of talk to you after this. So before we actually head into the outro today, I wanted to mention a tremendous resource available through the Canadian Mental Health Association of Windsor-Essex, which is called the Entrepreneurship on the Front Lines Resource Toolkit. Yeah, so it's not only filled with a ton of great exercises that can really sort of bring you back to the moment and, and settle your, your nerves when things are getting crazy, 
but it also links to additional resources like outreach workers and programming that you can start to access right away. So you don't have to wait on this stuff. Um, we're gonna post a link to that in the chat. I think John Mark may have already, um, but also when you go to the WeTech Alliance Founders Week page, you'll be able to find a toolbox with all of these great resources inside it uh, at the end of the week. Um, and so you'll be able to find that at wetech-alliance.com. So today we have a survey for all of our attendees inside this wonderful talk, this wonderful panel. Um, and so the survey is going to go around. Uh, what you'll be able to do with that is enter into a chance to get a $50 Windsor gift card. Um, the more times, and I, I feel like Sue, you're probably, uh, you, you got to have more entries than anyone else at this point. I think you've been on every one of these panels, but um, but the more times you enter, the more chances you get to actually uh, win the gift card. So please, uh, please complete that. Thank you to all of our panelists today for sharing their insights, for being so open and so vulnerable about some of the things they experienced in the last little while. It has not been an easy ride for any of us. Um, and I think as we head into this holiday season where we're all gearing up to do as much shopping as possible, Remember who kept our economy going the last two years. It was our small businesses. So please shop small, shop local as you plan on doing your holiday shopping this year. So before we close the events, I'll just ask the attendees that are comfortable to make sure that their videos are on and we can do a quick screenshot photo. Uh, Leanne, if you're able to get that for us. Sorry, just figuring myself out over here. That's okay. <laughs> Give, me <a> second. <laughs> Give me one second. All right. One, two, three. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, no problem. So thank you everybody for the panel today. And before everybody heads out, please uh, don't forget to check out the schedule for our upcoming events. Next up, there's a fireside chat with founder Jeff Mousson of Coding for Veterans at 2 p.m. And in case you missed it, Founders Week is offering a week of perks while quantities last. So please check, please check out the fun and freebies tab to learn more. And yeah, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.